uh, we are talking about closed loop recycling um, but you know before we talk about closed loop recycling of water we need to understand where the concept of this closed loop actually originates you know in the last 100 years uh, human development our growth has been very linear but nature doesn't work like that it's cyclic you know there's a start there's growth there's maturity there's dying and then there's reboot and that is the default design of nature by products are always a starting point for new life and that is the essence of creating a circular economy or creating a closed loop recycling you know system so that's what we want to do we want to create that awareness so that everybody is able to uh, recycle their wastewater because that is the only way we can have a water secure future yes the first step in climate action and sustainability practices is creating awareness This episode is about how a startup has worked around creating awareness and implementing projects in wastewater management. Stay tuned for an insightful conversation. Hello and a big warm welcome to yet another episode on the Mission Shunya podcast. Hope you're doing well. If you are part of the select few who write to me regularly providing feedback about the episodes, stories, etc, a special welcome to you. I read each and every single message and acknowledge them. Feedback is always welcome. Missionchunia at gmail dot com is the ID. You can also tag Missionchunia across the social media platforms. One such feedback that I received a year ago was asking about wastewater management. The intent being, water is a stressed asset, and we waste a lot of water during our use. So yes. I was looking around to see stories of entrepreneurs and evangelists who were pioneering wastewater management especially having experience in delivering both new and retrofit system and I found someone who offers it using organic methods and is decently scalable so let's get to the story with our guest who is Hi uh, my name is Aditi and uh, my organization Organic Solutions is basically committed to creating water abundance we are trying to provide nature based solutions for recycling of wastewater on site for communities and institution and helping them reduce um, their burden of fresh water and uh, enabling water sustainability for all Thanks Aditi now let's begin with your story i'm currently you're dealing with one of the biggest problems that cities in general and in everyone faces in dealing with wastewater and how do you treat them and how do you close the loop there but how did you end up trying to solve this problem what's your journey been so far until you got here uh yeah so you know Nirish i think uh, we're all connected to water consciously or subconsciously you know after all 75% of our body and the planet is water fair and you know my connection with water came at a young age we moved from delhi to gurgaon and you know i got introduced to the concept of uh water tankers and having a few no water days and if i look back the situation was nowhere as bad as it is today but even those very small random incidents made me question water availability and the path of water in and out of our houses and you know then i moved to singapore to study and the water reality there uh, you know the reality that i saw there was so different it was so futuristic hmm. anyways you know i came back and and i started working for a consulting firm <laughs> but very soon you know i found myself in a position where i didn't like what was happening to the planet around us and i wanted to contribute positively to it and you know i think that's when the penny first dropped you know somewhere back in 2009 10 when i realized that if we don't fix the environmental situation that we are heading into there will be no future generations and uh, you know the term social entrepreneurship was fairly new at that time mm. and i was very excited about this prospect of doing good and being able to make a living out of that, that. so i quit and that's that and why i chose waste water well because you know the potential is immense you know our sewage is literally everywhere correct so um that's how you know um organic solutions uh what we do it at organic solutions is that we are basically committed to creating water abundance and you know we want to move the dialogue from water scarcity to water abundance we're all talking about water scarcity today but you know there is a way to move towards water abundance and that's what we want to do and our vision is to you know transform how wastewater is viewed in our society you know because we're only looking at flush and forget culture right now so we want to move away from that we want to make communities move away from that single use culture and stop depleting uh, the finite water resources that we have you know because apart from the environmental consequences wastewater actually has value 
which we want to keep within the economy. So that's what we do. We provide nature-based solutions for closed-loop recycling of water on-site for communities, for institutions. So in a sense, we are reducing the burden on freshwater resources and enabling water sustainability. That's wonderful. I, I like the word like water abundance. And you do mention that your experience in Singapore, I mean, that's like, even if you live in large metropolis, I mean, like in most places around the world, people just say like, you can just drink water out of the tap. But we we, we haven't uh, got there uh, yet, especially in, in, in India, but it's slowly getting there. Yes, it is. So eventually when we get there, I think all the solutions that you're developing is kind of, is going to be very critical because everything has to be treated at source and you have, the, you have to close the loop at source. So that is a very big problem. And you did mention that it's been an entrepreneurial journey and although you, you say it's a social entrepreneurship, but I think it is much more than that, right? Because there is huge potential, there is huge market value and uh, along with it comes an economic value as well. So the last decade or so, you must have definitely seen a good growth and good response to your business and value proposition, correct? Yes, definitely. Uh, you know, in the last decade with, um, you know, the norms getting stricter and the government also kind of giving a push wherein, you know, sewage treatment is becoming mandatory for newer establishments and for newer communities that are coming up. We definitely, uh, you know, see that the wave is changing. Uh, people are becoming more aware of uh, the term, uh, terminology itself. I mean, uh, 10 years back, uh, people weren't even aware of sewage treatment or what really is um, sewage treatment all about and what are the different ways that you can treat your wastewater. Uh, but I think uh, people are becoming more aware now. And I would say people are also now becoming more uh, open to the idea of recycling uh, waste. Having said that, uh, like you mentioned in Singapore, in California, there's so many places in the world where wastewater is now being treated to the quality of drinking water. Mm. But in India, you know, there is a huge social stigma uh, when it comes to treating our wastewater and then drinking uh, it. You know, we keep uh, 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 things different for our kitchen and things different for our bathroom. And, you know, so there is a huge stigma. Mm. And uh, uh, we're not getting into, you know, changing that for people right away because it's a slow moving process. You know, it's a, it's a step towards um, the end goal. So the first step is to actually make them uh, ready to even uh, recycle their wastewater for non-portable uses. And that's what our focus right now is because there are uh, there's so many uses for which we're using portable water and we don't really need to do that so if we can recycle our wastewater for that i think it's a big win that's wonderful it starts small but start with some intent and some scale now looking at this you did mention for non portable use so i assume that could be something like gardening and using it for other cleaning purposes but in terms of typical household uh, what is a or a residential complex a medium sized residential complex in an urban city what is the scale that is possible to have these kind of solutions implemented? Uh, so the scale is immense, you know, because uh, actually only 30 to 40 percent of our water is the true portable demand. What we need for our showers, maybe and cooking and drinking. Um, but, you know, currently people are spending money to buy portable water for all their uses. And literally in one toilet flush, you have sent it down the drain. You've contaminated that water instantly. And then, uh, you know, our municipality spends our tax money to retreat that water because a lot of it is entering our freshwater resources. Uh, our lakes, our ponds, our rivers are all getting severely polluted. And then they send it back to us as portable water and then we buy it again. Mm. Or we are buying tankers of water which is mostly groundwater extraction which is done illegally. And we keep on repeating the cycle. It's insanity. I mean, why do we need drinking water quality to water our plants, to wash our car or to flush our toilets? You know, 200 years ago, water was abundant, our, pollution, uh, our population was not as much, our pollution was not as much, and we were flushing it down and the impact was not visible. But our wastewater is not invisible anymore, and we need to start tapping it, reusing it if we want a water secure future. So, like I, you know, we are committed to make wastewater recycling accessible for everyone. So we have a system that can be installed for, say, a single household where they can treat their grey water or sewage and recycle it to wash their cars, to water their plants, to reflush if they have dual plumbing, uh, dual plumbing, sorry. And uh, we provide solutions to small and big communities like a residential township or even a village, to institutions like schools, colleges, offices. Uh, we have set up systems for public parks in Gurgaon, you know, where sewage is extracted from the sewer line near the park treated in the park and the treated water irrigates the park. 
Um, villages can set up the system to recycle the wastewater to fill their ponds or to irrigate their farms. So sewage recycling solutions can actually be deployed at any scale, mm. uh, basically wherever sewage is available. And, you know, our sewage is all pervasive. It's everywhere. So the scale is immense. And we call it sewer mining, you know, because you need water somewhere, you tap the sewer, you treat the sewage and voila, you have water that you can reuse. So that's the scale that we're looking at. So this entire thing about closed loop recycling using water, as a product and solution, you have multiple ones, ones for small scale and one for also like a large complex and in different products, different solutions. Is this solution like, for example, is it easy to retrofit? And what is the process there involved? Because I assume when you have to build something new, like a new residential complex, having the systems in place is a little easy. But how easy is it for you to get in a residential complex and try to retrofit the system, a small one or a big one? So how easy or difficult is it? So it's not um, difficult to, um, you know, retrofit uh, it in an existing community or a township or an existing school or an institution. Mm. Uh, It's definitely uh, more easier to plan when it's a newer, uh, you know, township or a newer establishment. Um, But having said that, we have set up STPs in existing townships. uh, So it can be constructed as a civil structure. Mm. Or we can have prefabricated structures or we can have small plug and play modules and can then, you know, be scaled up according to whatever the flow is. And or we can, uh, we're even looking at, you know, um, uh, deploying container based uh, systems, you know, where they can be transported from one place to another. So the idea of uh, treatment remains the same, wherein, you know, we have a solution where the wastewater is getting treated. The containment can be, um, you know, designed differently or the containment can be civil or prefabricated. So retrofitting even an existing sewage treatment plant is not difficult. Say a sewage treatment plant, which is dysfunctional, it's not, um, you know, performing up to the mark or say it's been abandoned. Hmm. Uh, we can use the components of that sewage treatment plant and, uh, uh, you know, retrofit it to actually work in our uh, process. The other thing about water, just like any other resource, especially in urban centers, I I understand that a lot of thing goes unaccounted. Like, for example, there's a lot of leakage that happens in the system. And that is probably one of the biggest wastage that happens in the entire system. Uh, I'm sure this is, although a minor component in this, do you have any systems in place to kind of check like, okay, is this close to 100% or are there if still are there still scope for improvement in terms of efficiency of recovery or do you have any tools to monitor that uh, so when it comes to our system um you know we work on something called the cpheo manual so for example uh, we're working for an apartment complex or say we're working for a township then we know the number of flats will have uh, x number of people and would then generate x number of uh, you know x liters of wastewater So these are uh, standards, um, you know, by which the designing is done. Mm. And uh, you can have flow meters uh, installed to basically check the amount of water that is actually entering into the system. And in terms of recovery, we have, uh, you know, almost above 95% recovery. The only losses would be some evaporation that might happen from the reactor bed. Uh, so we can also have flow meters installed to check in the amount of water that is coming in, uh, coming in and then come going out of the system. So that way, you know, that correlation of recovery can be done, uh, from the system. In terms of leakages, uh, that are happening at the upstream, mm-hmm. you know, then it becomes a completely different, uh, project, uh, uh, wherein, you know, we're, uh, looking at also reducing, uh, the water, uh, consumption we are trying to tap the fact that no water is getting wasted and then whatever wasted water that that is coming out of our toilets or our kitchens or say other areas is then getting treated and then going back into the circle again currently uh, our focus is to basically give that water back for recycling Uh, but definitely with um, you know smart solutions like iot uh, you can have flow meters that are installed at various uh, levels in the infrastructure and then water uh, flow can be measured from there. And then you can always make out whether, uh, say, if you had, let's say, a fresh water tank and it was filled with, say, 1,000 liters of water, but the taps and everything are not getting uh, that much water or, say, uh, our plant is not getting that much water, then we know that there is some leakage somewhere. So we can always identify that. 
Oh, that's really good. Uh, that's really good to know when you have all the flow meters and sensors in place, it's most easily to track. Because when having spoken to a few stakeholders and asking about the sustainable initiatives they have taken, I kind of come across this point when they tell that we know there is a lot of leakage that's happening in a system, especially a large community when a large system water com- flows in. But there are leakages everywhere, even within the department complex, big uh, residential complex. So I think that will be their first problem that they want to solve when you present such solutions. Now, the other part is like also about the testing of the quality of the water once it's recycled. So are there any specific tests that you undertake or is it common test or how do you convince people saying like, okay, this water is really good and the quality is definitely on par with portable water? Uh, so, uh, like I said, the idea is not to make it portable water, even though the technology exists to do that. Mm. Um, but when it comes to recycling of water for non-portable uses, uh, like, you know, the last decade has been quite the water action decade, even in our country, uh, wherein, you know, um, stringent norms have come into place where, uh, you know, people have to meet those particular standards if they want to use the water for flushing or for, say, uh, gardening or for say construction, you know, whatever that they want to use this water for. So there are standards that are, that, that have been set out by the Central Pollution Control Board of India. And then there are stringent standards that have been uh, set out by the NGT, the National Green Tribune. Fair. So our uh, systems are designed to basically meet those standards. So whatever water that is coming out of our uh, treatment systems is meeting those norms. And uh, they are laboratory tests that can be done on the samples that, you know, are picked up from the outlet of the treatment system. And they can be uh, tested. So we encourage our clients to get the testing done themselves, you know, because that is what builds the trust. Because if I pick up the sample, they can always tell me, I don't know what you've done to the sample. So we encourage them to to pick them up uh, themselves and then get it tested in any uh, accredited lab. And then they can match it with the standards that have been set up by the government of India. And that's when you know that the water is um, fit for use. Um, but if you just look at uh, certain olfactory measures, like if you smell the water, if you look at the water, it will look like drinking water. Hmm. Um, but definitely, you know, um, it's important to get these tests done to, uh, you know, uh, get to build that trust uh, with our clients. So we keep getting them done regularly for our systems and whatever the client wants to get it done themselves and we encourage them to do it themselves as well. Correct. Quality and trust is one thing that the clients look for. But the other part that definitely clients uh, look for is the cost factor, especially when new systems new systems come saying like they are sustainable and they are good for the planet. There is this general perception that um, it is going to be costly. It's going to be a little expensive compared to the alternate ones. So why should we invest in these systems? So how do you go about convincing clients to adopt better solutions? Are you cost competitive or or if I were to put it better than the current market prices for existing systems? Uh, so, you know, the um, problem that, you know, the industry faces currently is that, you know, there are um, so many uh, STP providers, you know, that are providing different technologies. Hmm. Uh, and there is absolutely no um, apples to oranges comparisons that happen. Right. So when we were developing a solution for wastewater treatment, uh, we wanted to create a sustainable solution that will actually be an asset to the user instead of a liability. Correct. Um, uh, when I say that, um, you know, what I really mean is that uh, if you look at um, what is happening in our country right now is that India is generating about 7,200 crore liters of sewage every single day. Mm-hmm. Out of this, only 2,000 crore liters is treated. And, um, you know, the rest is being discharged directly into groundwater or, say, freshwater resources. And that is what has led most of our ponds, lakes, rivers being severely polluted. And even the sewage that is getting treated in, you know, big centralized STPs of our cities and our towns, uh, it's not getting recycled back into use. And this cycle is vicious. And this is what is creating the water crisis in our country. You know, because these centralized options have a lot of challenges. For example, if you're transporting the sewage from all parts of a developing city, to one centralized plant, it's an expensive affair. And it is also adding tremendously to the carbon footprint of wastewater treatment because of all the pumping involved. So essentially, to solve one problem, we end up creating an array of other problems. You know, and the, being capital intensive projects, the uh, the demand supply gap is so huge and which is why most of the sewage is untreated. So the simple solution that people have come up with is to basically decentralize the infrastructure. You basically right. treat the sewage at the point where it is generated and with policy changes and, you know, the push that the government is giving, there's definitely a change 
like I mentioned, towards adopting these decentralized systems. But still our sewage is reaching our lakes and rivers and why is that happening? You know, because centralized systems have blindly been miniaturized uh, for decentralized infrastructure. Now, these treatment systems uh, require constant power. They need skill and dedicated manpower. Then they have environmental issues like, you know, you have to dispose of sludge or you have high carbon footprint. And unfortunately, what happens is due to lack of knowledge, most times communities and institutions, they end up only assessing the capital costs. They do not factor in the life cycle costs uh, or the costs to keep these systems running for, say, 10, 15 years. What happens when the STP provider has done his job, he's installed and he leaves? The operation and maintenance for the community becomes cumbersome because you need to run these STPs 24-7. So you need power. In case there is a power cut, you need to give them genset backup. Correct. You know, uh, so you need three people to run the STP round the clock, even for the smallest one. And if you don't operate them properly, you don't get good quality of water. The treatment is not proper. Then you say STPs don't work. And eventually these systems become a liability for the owners and they abandon it. <laughs> and that is the biggest problem uh, when it comes to actually treating uh, wastewater. And we wanted to change that narrative, you know, by creating water recycling options that were accessible to everyone, every community, every institution at the micro level. So they should be able to easily uh, be set up and operated hassle-free for generations to um, come. And that is what brings me to the life cycle cost assessment of our technology vis-a-vis other system. You know, if you do that, uh, then uh, the life cycle cost is much lower than these uh, aerobic STPs. But what happens is when we go to the clients, the only comparison that is done is cost versus cost of capital. And that is not an apples to oranges comparison because the same technology in the market can be available for say 2 lakhs and then will go up to 10 lakhs also for the same flow the same technology it completely depends on the way the vendor is designing it so it becomes very difficult to uh, do that comparison which is why we always tell the client to look at a wholesome picture if you're looking at setting up an asset you need to see that this is not just to uh, meet the government regulation you need to actually run this stp because you want to recycle the wastewater And if you want to do that, then you need to see whether you'll be able to run this STP for, say, 10, 15, 20 years. And that's where the economics kick in. Uh, In terms of duration, like for the life cycle analysis, like what is the period that you take? So usually we do analysis, uh, an analysis of about 10 years for our clients. Okay. uh, Because um, usually the life cycle of our STPs can go up to 20, 25 years uh, if it's a civil structure. Okay. But if it's a prefabricated structure, then, you know, 10, 15 years. So we usually do this 10-year life cycle assessment for our clients. So if I take an example, you know, a community of um, 70 flats, if they set up this STP, they're going to be uh, basically recycling 50,000 liters of water on a daily basis. Hmm. Now, that's 18 crore liters of water over 10 years or, say, 36,000 water tankers in 10 years. Now, if you look at the amount of uh, money that this community, I'm not even comparing STP to STP. I'm just comparing the fact that there is a payback to setting up an STP. Um, the community will actually spend anything between 2.5 to say 4.5 crores at the current price of buying the tankers. So in that sense, if you're setting up our treatment system, the payback will be say less than two years. Uh, but the only catch here is that this value of payback is realized only by people who are buying water. <laughs> A lot of communities are doing that, but uh, still a lot of communities, a lot of institutions have enough water supply. So they are not able to uh, see this payback because the government is providing them water at a very subsidized rate currently. But what we tell them is that it's called being future ready. You know, when the water supply will become low for you, then recycled water is the cheapest and the safest option for getting water. That is true. That is true. As long as the true value of water, the cost is not reflected to at the consumer end, then there is definitely going to be this disparity between their thoughts and what is the real value of the resources that they are using. Now, there is this perception, anything organic or anything around organic and sustainability, there is there's always this perception, be it like organic food, organic clothing, or even for example, like when you say organic nature-based solutions, is it really organic? Is it really true? to its real sense or meaning. So how do you convince clients about what you offer is the unique thing that you're doing it? So, you know, when we were uh, developing our solution, what we realized was that we need to learn, uh, you know, from the most sustainable teacher. And that's nature. Fair. You know, because nature has spent 3.8 billion years doing R&D 
uh, that is required to sustain life on our planet. Hmm. It's just that we humans have moved away from those learnings and we've created all these problems for ourselves. Now, what we have done is we apply modern principles to nature's working and it, that's called biomimicry Correct. or regenerative design where you're giving more than what you take. And that's where we based our solution. Uh, we wanted to purify water. So we just asked the question, how does nature purify water? And we found the answer on the very ground that we stand on. It's actually the largest water filter. Hmm. Whatever water that is falling onto the ground is getting filtered through various layers and then finally reaching our groundwater, which we're anyways using. So that's the uh, the basic principle. Our sewage treatment system, uh, we call it the advanced eco-reactor. It's basically mimicking the principles of healthy soil to filter and to biologically treat wastewater, which other STP technologies are using electricity and power hogging motors to do or blowers to blow air into the water and then creating a whole lot of other uh, problems. If we take one spoonful of healthy soil, it has more life than the entire human population or not. But due to our own activities, you know, it is very difficult to get healthy soil also. So what we have done is we've created the right mix. Uh, uh, basically, we've uh, done our research on what healthy soil really looks like mm. and what it was maybe, say, 200, 300, 400 years ago. What it had was the right mix of organic matter, some inert rock material, uh, and a whole lot of microbial population and earthworms. So in fact, what we've done is we've turbocharged the natural process. This treatment technology is called vermifiltration. Okay. Uh, basically, using the power of earthworms and microbes to treat wastewater. Because wastewater has fecal matter and other components that is food for this, uh, you know, for the earthworms and uh, microbes. So wastewater is basically trickling down the various layers that are created in the STP. It doesn't look like an STP, actually. Uh, it can be developed like even a garden. Nice. And in the process, the water gets cleaned as this whole surface that we have created gets covered with microbial biofilms. And those are the actual guys who are treating the wastewater. They are the ones who do all the work in any kind of STP. And it's a natural ecosystem. So you don't need constant external tweaking. Uh, what comes out can be safely recycled. And um, working in tandem with nature has so many advantages. You know, like we don't have to worry about uh, separating and disposing of sludge. Uh, sludge is basically this slurry type material of solids and dead bacteria which comes out of other STPs. Uh, people have to dispose it off so they're cost to that and usually they end up uh, either in the water bodies or they end up in the landfills creating another problem. So we don't have that. Uh, the earthworms digest all of that. They convert it into vermicompost compost actually. And um, so it's true to its nature. There is no waste. Uh, our system does not need constant power. It can even run on solar power. Nice. It does not need technical staff to run it. Uh, even a gardener can be trained to take care of it. We don't need, uh, we don't add any chemicals. So, and we're not contributing to climate change because our carbon footprint of the STP is low. We work with, uh, you know, municipalities, villages, paramilitary forces, schools, hospitals, resorts. The proof of our solution lies in the fact that, you know, most of our installations are word of mouth references with our clients becoming our strongest advocates. You know, like today I got pictures from one of our projects, you know, we had set up for an urban village near Gurgaon. Mm. And they actually did the flag hoisting ceremony in the village next to the treatment plant. So that's testimony to the fact that we have actually created an asset for the village instead of a liability that they abandoned. You know, it's like a park, uh, a meeting point for them. So, you know, if we could create these systems that users don't abandon, we treat the water up to the required quality. We're not creating other problems like sludge or, you know, carbon emissions. And we've got ourselves a sustainable way forward and it shows. That's true. Clients are definitely the biggest supporters. And uh, when you have people giving you references from previous clients, then that's really a sign that the solution definitely works. And there is a lot of evangelism that happens in that way. So Aditi, on a final note, I like the solution is good. And uh, so what are your next plans in the next few years to scale this up as a business? Where do you see going forward? And uh, how can people get in touch with you? And uh, how can they help you in this business? Uh, so, Girish, uh, we're, um, like I mentioned, you know, the scale that we're working at is that sewage is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the first point um, has been so far for us also to create awareness and to create knowledge around, uh, you know, nature-based solutions. And I don't e see that ending anytime soon because just in India, you know, it's uh, such a vast market. And I would say that, you know, we've only maybe touched uh, 1% of um, the people you know the first step is to 
create awareness you know uh, we are talking about closed loop recycling um, but you know before we talk about closed loop recycling of water we need to understand where the concept of this closed loop actually originates you know in the last 100 years uh, human development our growth has been very linear correct but nature doesn't work like that it's cyclic you know there's a start there's growth there's maturity there's dying and then there's reboot and that is the default design of nature exactly byproducts are always a starting point for new life and that is the essence of creating a circular economy or creating a closed loop recycling um, you know system and if we look at water we look at water cycle you know we know water is a finite source now because we learn it Hmm. but you know nature has been carrying out that water cycle process so well for billions of years and it has created this illusion of infinity even today when it rains we feel we've got new water but it's not new water the reality is that there is no more water on earth today than there was 4 billion years ago so fundamentally nature has been recycling it for billions of years what we're drinking today was essentially dinosaur pee at one point in time right what we need to do is to replicate nature we need to recycle our water over and over again and that is what we want to do we want to create that uh, awareness that nature doesn't have waste we humans call it waste and what happens when you call something waste you just have this attitude i want to get rid of it i want to make it invisible but the minute you start considering it as a resource you start seeing the value in it true so that's what we want to do we want to create that awareness so that everybody is able to uh, recycle their wastewater because that is the only way we can have a water secure future and uh, anybody who wants to uh, you know whether it's a small house uh, and you know uh, or if it's a small community or if it's a school if it's a college even if people want to um, you know implement it in their public parks we've done that in gurgaon it's it's very doable parks are parching away in summers and whatever little water that they get is all, again fresh water again insanity using drinking water to water these parks so there are a huge uh, lot of areas that you know the the wastewater recycling can be implemented and uh, we're looking to just create that awareness that uh, wastewater can be recycled and it can be done in a cost effective and a sustainable way so i think that is where most of our efforts go into that's wonderful i mean creating awareness as a first step just like how this podcast aims to create awareness about all the things around getting to net zero carbon emissions and all sustainability stories that's that's the intent create awareness and i'm sure it will just snowball i mean it will just snowball as time progresses and a lot of stories positive stories come out in the open i think it will just a matter of time well aditi it's been wonderful catching up with you on this particular topic it's it's very interesting and uh, we don't really give it enough thought to kind of think about what happens after we flush the water so what happens to it so we don't take time to think about that because we have access to resources and we kind of exploit it without thinking about the future so it's been wonderful having you on the podcast thanks for taking time uh, to join me on the show today thank you so much girish uh, for the wonderful interaction yes we concluded the conversation reminding ourselves that nature works on closed loop systems with feedback both positive and negative interestingly in the recent past a scientific journal concluded that even rainwater which for long has been considered the purest form of water is not any more so that's really unfortunate on where we are headed but we can definitely undertake small actions at our end and make it count in ensuring the closed loop recycling of water so the action item for this episode well please see if your household or apartment complex has water recycling units well even before that go around your residence and check if all the taps pipes and fittings are working fine in fact i did that exercise recently and figured out one small leak a very very small one which i fixed instantly with tools in hand so yes water is precious and piped water is even more precious because it takes a lot of energy to treat it pump it and deliver it to your taps which is also a huge contributor to the emissions so i will leave you with that thought for more interesting sustainability stories you can also follow terrageneration.com our friends who are creating the beautiful artworks that you see in the recent episodes they are a content agency specialized in telling the stories of people and organizations working in climate biodiversity conservation and sustainability the links to connect with aditi will be in the show notes section of this episode So please do check and reach out to Aditi to know more about wastewater treatment. 
And remember, please spread the message about Mission Shunya podcast in your network. It just takes about 30 seconds or less. And if you haven't left a review or rating on Apple Podcast, please do so. Until next time, this is Girish Shivakumar signing off and as always, thank you for listening.